Hi everybody, Physics Ninja here. Today what I want to do now is go back and analyze some of the recent short videos that I've created on the wheel and a string attached to a crank arm, right? I did a whole series of videos that looked at which direction is the wheel going to move if I pull on that string. Uh, we looked at the case where the force was horizontal, the force could be at an angle, and I also recently did one where I put the crank arm at an angle. All right, so in here we're gonna dig into the math, we're gonna write down equations of motion and truly understand the reasoning why we see different behaviors depending on the wheel setup that I have. All right, like with all my videos, if you like it, give it a thumbs up. Consider subscribing to Physics Ninja. It's the best way to support what I do. All right, let's get started. Here's the basic setup for this problem. I have a wheel, it has a radius uppercase R. My crank arm here will start in this vertical position and the length is going to be denoted by little r. Now I tied a string to the crank arm at the end of it, so that force here that I'm going to apply, in this case it's shown at an angle theta with respect to uh, the horizontal, um, and that force has a magnitude which we're just going to write equal to F. Now, uh, this is quite a general case, even though the crank arm is in that vertical position, it could still cover many of the cases I looked at in the video. For example, if I set this angle equal to zero, that angle theta, uh, then the system looks just like this, and that represents that horizontal pull force that I had. Now, if I make the crank arm even bigger, well, this is what I have, and that was one of the cases I looked at, where the crank arm uh, length was bigger than the radius of that disc. So we're going to start with this previous case and then look at some of the other limits and go back to the videos just to make sure that everything makes sense. All right, so the first thing we do is we're going to look at our wheel and uh, we need to define a coordinate system. So here's what I'm going to do for this problem. It'll just be a standard coordinate system with positive x pointing to the right, positive y pointing upward. Uh, now what we need to do is add all of the forces to the wheel. Okay, so the wheel here has a weight. Uh, the weight has a magnitude equal to mg, and its direction is down, represented by that purple arrow. Now, what else? We do have the wheel that is resting on this surface right here, so there has to be a normal force. Now, I've offset a little bit, the, but the normal force should be acting right at the place of contact of the wheel and the table. And again, the weight should also be acting at the center of mass of the wheel, which should be right at the center. So those vectors should probably be right on top of each other, but just for clarity, I'm just gonna offset them a little bit so we could see all the forces. Now, another force that is very important in this problem is the force of friction. And in this case, it is a force of static friction, and I'm gonna place static friction that is opposing this applied force here, or at least the X component of that applied force. And it's static because the point that comes into contact with the surface actually is not slipping. And that's a very, very important property of the system. So this is what we have for static friction. All right, so if I am able to resolve what the acceleration vector is. And if I find an acceleration that points to the right in that positive x direction, guess what? It means that the center of mass of the wheel is going to move to the right. And if my acceleration that I solve for ends up being a negative value, so less than zero, it means the center of mass of that wheel will move to the left. Okay, so and that is a really, really key aspect of this problem. Our goal now is simply to find what is the acceleration in terms of those forces. So for that, we have to look at applying Newton's laws to this problem. All right, so we start off by writing Newton's laws. Again, I'm using that coordinate system. Uh, so we start with the x direction. Uh, we have our two forces in the x direction. We've got a component of my applied tension force here uh, that is pointing in the positive x direction and its component is f cosine of theta. And then I have this force of static friction that is acting to the left. That is the negative x direction, so I put minus fs here. And that has to be equal to the mass times the acceleration of the center of mass of this wheel in the x direction. All right. In the y direction, it's a little bit more straightforward. There is no acceleration of the wheel in the y direction as long as I don't pull too hard on that, uh, on that uh, string. Uh, but this is what we have. We've got the normal force acting up. We've got the weight acting down. And again, you can't forget about that vertical component over here of this applied force. That is F sine of theta. And I don't want any acceleration here in that vertical direction, so I set the right-hand side equal to zero. All right, my goal right now is to solve for what is this acceleration. If it's positive, it moves to the right. If it's negative, it moves to the left. 
However, I have one equation here, but I have another unknown. I'm not certain what this force of static friction is. So I have to introduce at least another equation in order to eliminate this unknown. So what we're gonna do in order to introduce another equation is we're gonna look at the torques acting on this wheel. The first thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna place a pivot point. And right here, I'm gonna place this bottom point of the rim of the wheel that is in contact with the surface. And I'm gonna place a pivot point about uh, right there at that position, okay? Uh, the next goal now will be to calculate what is the net torque produced by all of these forces if my pivot point is right here. Now you could look at the torque about any point, it doesn't matter. It turns out that it's easier to choose this as your pivot point because it turns out that many of these forces do not produce a torque if the pivot point is here. And my goal now will be to apply Newton's second law for rotation for this system. So it's a little bit different. I have to look now at the net torque produced by all of those forces. And that equals to the moment of inertia about that pivot multiplied by the angular acceleration of the wheel. All right, this is how you solve the torque on the left-hand side. You're right, well, the net torque is the torque due to all of the forces. It's the torque from the applied force, the torque due to the weight, the torque due to the normal, plus the torque due to that static friction. You need to add all of those up as vectors. That must be equal to the moment of inertia of that pulley multiplied by its angular acceleration. All right, now I'm gonna assume that you know how to calculate the torque due to constant forces. Um, and you see right here the advantage of choosing my pivot point right here at the bottom because in that case, the torques due to these three forces equal to zero. The normal and the force of static friction are acting right at the pivot point, therefore there is no moment arm for those. Uh, the torque due to the weight, since the weight acts at the center of mass and that force goes through that pivot point, there's also zero torque produced by uh, that force. So all you're left with now is the torque produced by this applied force F. All right, so let's evaluate that torque due to the force F. Uh, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna just clean up this diagram. I don't need the normal force anymore. Let's get rid of some of these. I don't need the weight anymore since I'm just looking at the torque. And I actually also get rid of that friction force. All right, this cleans up the diagram quite a bit. Now what you wanna do is the best thing to do I think would be to break that force down into components. We have a horizontal component, which is F cosine of theta. And we're going to have a vertical component for this force. This is F sine of theta, the way that I've defined that angle theta for this problem. Now, how do you calculate the torque due to that force F? What you really need to do here is we're going to need this distance right here. This distance is nothing more than the radius of the wheel minus the length of that crank arm. That is that distance. That is the moment arm for this component of the force. So at the end, you can always write down that the force produced by F is the force produced by its X component plus the torque produced by its Y component. That's the total force here produced by that force. And that's equal to the moment of inertia with respect to the pivot times angular acceleration. Now, if you had a look at this, this is my vertical component, Fy. This here is the x component of that applied force. Again, for the same arguments we just used, you would say that there is no torque produced by Fy because it is acting on a line that goes through that pivot point. There is no moment arm for that. All right, so what are we left with? We're only left with the torque produced by this component. So that's pretty straightforward. That is the magnitude of the force, F cosine of theta, what else? The distance to the pivot is r minus little r, and that's it, okay? Equals to moment of inertia about the pivot multiplied by the angular acceleration. All right, I'm gonna box this equation up because this is a really important equation for us. This gives us a second equation. So now let's put everything together and solve for what the acceleration is. It might seem like we've introduced a new variable here, this variable alpha, which is the angular acceleration of the wheel. However, what we're going to do here is we're going to apply the no-slip condition. What I want this wheel to do is I want it to simply roll, okay? And if it rolls, there is a connection here between this angular acceleration and the acceleration of the center of mass. And my connection is this that the acceleration of the center of mass is equal to the radius of the wheel multiplied by alpha. 
It means that alpha is acceleration over the radius, and that allows me to eliminate this guy right here. And that is going to allow me to find what is the acceleration of the center of mass by simply rearranging this equation. All right, if I combine everything here, this is everything we've worked on so far. My first equation came from Newton's second law for um, the acceleration in that horizontal direction. Uh, equation two came from looking at the net torque acting on the wheel produced by all of those forces. If my pivot is down there where the wheel comes in contact with the ground. And if I apply a condition where I want the acceleration of the center of mass... Uh, to be related to the angular acceleration of that wheel, um, and I want the wheel to roll and not slide. Okay, they call that the no-slip condition. Actually, all I need to solve for acceleration, and that was the total goal of this, is simply to combine two and three. I don't even have to use equation one by choosing my pivot point down here. So this is what we get. Um, so let me write the left-hand side here. Uh, sorry, the right-hand side is that moment of inertia with respect to the pivot. And instead of writing alpha, I'm going to write this as a center of mass divided by R. And that has to be equal to all of this term, which was F cosine of that angle theta and R minus little r. Okay, let's isolate now for the center of mass, right? That's what we're trying to find. And again, this is really in this x direction here. That is what I'm trying to solve for. I bring r on the other side, and I can divide through by that moment of inertia. Now, a little comment about that moment of inertia. It's about this pivot point right here. So what you can do is you can relate it to the moment of inertia of the wheel using something called the parallel axis theorem. So it's related to the parallel axis theorem by the moment of inertia through the center of mass of a wheel or a disc in this case. Plus, there's a correction term here, which comes from the parallel axis theorem. Just write that down. This is not going to change much in terms of the sign of the acceleration, but it would change the magnitude. So if I bring r on the other side, I get f r cosine of theta. And here I get r minus little r, and then divided now by this total moment of inertia, which is the moment of inertia through the center of mass plus mr squared. All right, it took quite a bit of work to get here, but let's have a look at this expression. This here explains many, many of the cases that I looked at in the previous uh, shorts that I created. Let's have a look at all the limiting cases now from this equation. All right, so let's look at one of the first cases I looked at. Uh, little r was less than the radius, right? So we have uh, here. Uh, what else? I also have that I'm pulling kind of horizontally. So I have that angle theta, which is equal to zero degrees. So that means my complicated expression for the acceleration reduces to this fr, r minus r, and divided by the denominator, which is just the total moment of inertia about that pivot. Now, the bottom here is always positive, okay, and that's simply going to affect the magnitude of that acceleration. But we're really only interested in the sign. Is the acceleration going to be positive or negative? And for this problem here, it's solely controlled by this term right here. If little r is less than big r, if big r is bigger than little r, clearly this term here is going to be positive. Remember what we said, if the acceleration is bigger than zero, it means that the entire wheel will move to the right. All right, in the second case here, we have to switch the sign, right? Because we now have little r, the length of the crank arm is bigger than the radius, right? As you can see by that purple crank arm in the, in the figure, the angle is still zero degrees, but that is going to change quite a few things. Let me change all of this. So if little r is bigger in magnitude uh, than the radius, you see that this term here is going to be a negative value, okay? That means that the acceleration is less than zero. Well, in that case, it means that the wheel and the center of mass of the wheel must move to the left because that was the coordinate system that we picked at the beginning. I also considered cases where um, the string was at an angle with respect to that horizontal direction. Um, in all of the cases that I considered with the string at an angle, I had that the crank arm length was less than the radius of the wheel. So that means that this term here in the bracket is going to be strictly positive for all the angle cases that I've considered. So the only thing that determines whether or not acceleration is bigger or less than zero will be this cosine of the angle theta. 
Well, let's think about what that angle theta could be. If the string was horizontal, the angle was zero. And if I go all the way to 90 degrees, I know in that case, cosine of any of those angles is going to be bigger than zero. So automatically, if I pull that string at any angle between this axis and between that axis, any angle theta, I am going to get an acceleration for the center of mass that is going to be positive, which means that the wheel is forced to move to the right. What's interesting now is what if I did an angle that was below this axis, right? Even if the angle was below the axis, the acceleration would still be to the right because this is a positive function. What's interesting also, think about another condition. Well, what happens now if the angle is bigger than 90 degrees? What if I pull on it that way? Ah, well, in that case, cosine of theta is going to switch signs. If you remember what the graph of cosine looks like, a graph of cosine will look like this. All right, here is zero degrees. Here's my uh, 90 degrees. You can see it's always positive in this range. But what happens when I get above 90 degrees? Above 90 degrees, cosine becomes negative, right? So any angle on this side clearly is gonna make that acceleration a negative value. So that's consistent with, with what we would expect. Now I did look at one other series of cases where I started the crank arm at an angle. And imagine here I define this angle alpha with respect to that horizontal. In all my experiments, I only did the short crank arm example and I also had another restriction. Um, I apply the force uh, F uh, in a way that it was always, I tried to keep it perpendicular to the crank arm. Otherwise there's just so many variables, it's hard to do all the experiments. Anyway, I'm not gonna do the calculation in this case, but if you do the calculation following the same step by applying the pivot point down here at the bottom, you're going to get to this expression. Now it is actually a little bit more interesting uh, from a physical standpoint, because now the sign of the acceleration is determined by this, okay? This whole term. And this term here could be positive or negative depending on the values of R, depending on the radius of the wheel, but now they also depend on this angle here, alpha, which is interesting. So that means you could get the acceleration of the center of mass to either move to the right, you could move it to the left, and guess what? There is also an angle where you actually have that term in the bracket equal to zero. So in that case, there is no acceleration. You would simply tend to uh, slip, okay? There would be no rotation in that case. So this is kind of an interesting one that I looked at my video. I would see if you can go ahead and obtain this result for yourself. All right, that's it for me, folks. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.